Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. The texts for this week are the fourth Sunday after Epiphany, which falls on January 29th, 2023. The first reading is Micah 6, verses 1 through 8. Our psalm is the 15th psalm. Our second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 31. And our gospel today is the fifth chapter of Matthew, and we'll be reading the familiar text, verses 1 through 12. So we're going up on a mountain today. <laughs> Lots of great texts here, too. There's mm -hmm. a feast for preachers this Sunday. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, and this, you said it's a familiar text, right, Joy, the Beatitudes. And it's worthwhile, I think, for the preacher to step back for a minute and again say, you know, we're, we're just getting our feet wet back in Matthew again and, and this gospel. And this is such an important text, obviously, because people know it so well. And it's, it is, you know, in, 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 it's Matthew's like central verses, right, for Jesus. But that's the thing, right? It really is setting the tone for the entire gospel. And so for the for the preacher to step back and say, uh, this sermon is not only, a, I think this sermon is not just about this Sunday, but it really is introducing the congregation once again to uh, the central themes of Matthew's Jesus or Matthew's Christology. And so for, for the preacher to spend some time thinking about what difference does it make? And Matt, uh, Matt you've talked about this. I've talked about this, that, that this, these are, these are Jesus opening verses, right? This is his opening act in the gospel of Matthew. Uh, he has said in 417, from that time, Jesus began to proclaim repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And now we hear what the kingdom of heaven is about. And so that making that connection, I think, for, uh, for our listeners is important that that repent is that changing your perspective. What is a kingdom of heaven perspective? And now we see right away what what does the kingdom of heaven look like? What is it marked by? What kind of behavior does it call for? Uh, who does the kingdom of heaven acknowledge that the world doesn't? And so that, that wider perspective is, I think, a first homiletical step this week. I really appreciate that, Caroline. And uh, I think I've said this before, but I'm always struck by Dallas Willard's setting of chapter five. And uh, I would, uh, in that setup that you're talking about, encourage uh, our, our preachers to take a look at uh, chapter four, verse 23. So um, it's, it's that continuation from verse 17 that uh, is the theme, the words, but those words come after works. They come after actions. In, in verse, uh, as chapter four ends, uh, we have Jesus in action. He's healing. Um, he's, he's announcing the good news in his deeds. And that's what, how the news spread about him. Uh, because he was healing various kinds of diseases. He was reaching out to those who were in pain, those who were possessed by demons, those who uh, had epilepsy, epilepsy, those who were paralyzed, and he healed them. And so they are experiencing the presence of God, not just intellectually, but actually in their bodies. And that news is what is spreading. And it's against that that these words are said. And Dallas Willard says that uh, um, that Jesus gave vocabulary to what the people had experienced. So something so awesome had occurred. And, and how do I explain this healing more than just saying I'm grateful? How do I explain this this? cataclysmic change in my life other than saying, wow. Well, Jesus said, there's this idea of what it means to be blessed. 
And that blessing is not simply material. That blessing is comfort of heart. That blessing is shalom. That blessing is being named children of God. That blessing is being filled. And, and all of a sudden, those words are not a promise, but the words are a testimony to the promise already made real in their lives. I, I would set that up as, as the second homiletical move. Yeah, those are the people who constitute the crowds also. So when Jesus saw the crowds, these people who have been coming from a significant, <laughs> a significant geographical area. Um, so, so don't miss that too at the end of, of chapter four. The sermon itself then is presented as to his followers, as to his closest people. And so I think it's the sermon is everything that both of you have said that it is, but it's also his way of saying, don't count the crowds out. Don't think that this is just an opening prelude to moving on to more power or to a more elite audience or something. This is where the blessings of God are going to reside among the poor in spirit, the meek, the merciful, the um, you know people who are broken and grieving. Um, I think that's really, really key when you think about the expectations at the beginning of this movement and where we're going to get to when we hit the Sunday of the Transfiguration in what three weeks after this week, that it's not about laying the groundwork for something that's going to attract a different kind of people. It's kind of get used to this. This is where this ministry is going to reside. We're not going to Sepphoris. We're not going to the big cities. We're not going to be in Caesarea. We're going to be in low-lying areas in terms of how that's, you know, the dominant culture views it. And we're going to be with the people who experience the blessings of God in Jesus's own presence, but also in their, um, I don't want to say they're down and outness, but in a way, right? These are not the people you would go to if you wanted to say, show me where God's blessings are being experienced on earth. Um, and that's such an important text. I mean, I think that everything you said, Caroline, as well, that it's not just, it's the, it's the opening statement in a gospel that has so many disturbing passages yet to come. <laughs> so many passages that, that look harsh or unfeeling. And so this is the, these are the 12 verses that I always want to hold Jesus to account to when he says things that make me think, well, that's kind of nasty, but he's always going back to where are the, <laughs> who are the people that are expendable, right? Or they're kind of viewed as maybe beyond where God's blessings reside, which is where Jesus promises to be. And then he's going to end his public ministry with the sheep and the goats, with another parable about surprise and about encountering Jesus in surprising places. So I can't personally make sense of Matthew without those two bookends to the public ministry being really crucial for interpreting all that comes in between. Yeah. And I, I think the other thing about, about these verses and about what Jesus is calling his disciple, his disciples to, that's it's kind of subtle here, but but it's going to take on a next week. Of course, it'll take on a more obvious reality with you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world that there's this combination of this blessedness, right? This this uh, this sense of as you were talking about, Matt, who, who, where will you find the mercy and the, the righteousness and the, uh, it, it's going to be um, among people and in places that you don't expect. And at the same time, this kingdom calls for a particular kind of, uh, a kingdom kind of action. And so you have that, that shift in uh, between six and seven, you know, blessed are those who hunger, you have this hunger and thirst for righteousness. But maybe not. It's not a. It's not a huge shift. But that blessed are the merciful. So that that being and that doing are kind of inter intermingled. And it's and it's not just. Uh, it's it is that uh, that blessedness for where you are of, of that of of that um, places of mourning and that and that uh, and the meek and those who mourn as, as I said those who mourn but it's also at the same time 
uh, what is it going to mean to act this out? Uh, it, you know, a call to action. And I, and I find that really interesting too, that there's not this sort of, uh, there's this, there's this integration of that. Uh, and that's also what we're being called to as well. And, uh, like blessed are the peacemakers, for example, the verb there or that the word there actually is the persons who do peace, right? That are the people who make peace. Uh, and so it, there's this, there's this undercurrent here of, of active, active faith or active following acting these things out. I remember a number of years ago, I commented on this passage and, and where I talked about this, you know, this is a call to action and, and active, active, uh, active reality. And uh, I got so much negative feedback about that because it's not a call to action. This is blessedness, but it, it is. But how is it that you, how is it that it's in that, out of that blessedness that you are, you, you know, you're able, you are able to embody to what extent God is calling you to do or what Jesus is calling you to do. So uh, it's, a, it's a, it's a complicated thing, but it's, it's so present there of recognizing this is not, uh, yeah, that is not just, you know, that I'm blessed, but that, that I'm blessed, um, as my mother would always say, blessed to be a blessing. <laughs> uh, but it's, um, and I even felt that, uh, just one more thing about that. I even felt that this, this, to be perfectly honest, this Sunday was really, really hard to prep because this, this was one of the passages that my dad maybe wanted in his sermon or in his service. And then his verse on the front of his service bulletin was Micah 6 8. And, uh, and so I thought, I just want to sit in the blessedness of blessed are those who mourn, right? That I just want to sit there the whole time and just feel that, right? Just feel that, that, um, uh, what does it mean to be, um, in that space. But at the same time, I thought also in that what I've been experiencing, this is a very personal reaction here, but also what I've been experiencing is that um, grief is also very much doing. It's, a, it's, um, it, it's, it's not just being, but it is this act, active thing that you do. And so I, uh, I don't know if I'm making any sense, but how does, how do we talk about that it's not this super, it's not this easy separation because of what you are and what you do, um, or what you feel and what you do. You, you are, does that make sense at all? I'm like, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I, 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 I think that the looking back and the looking forward, um, means that we read this text in a sense of not simply an, a pronouncement, mm -hmm. but as a call, and uh, I, I think you're, you're the, that you've set it up very well in terms of, as you were speaking, I, I think of my own grief uh, at my mom's death and having to, or I don't want to say having, I don't want to make it sound like it was a, a, a responsibility, but because of having gone through my own grief, being able to be sensitive um, when your mom died, Caroline, and being able to be sensitive, uh, even as I was still in my own mourning, um, to, to know not to say trite things, um, to allow people um, to get choked up, um, because it was out of my experience of mourning and being comforted that I could extend what had been extended to me. And so I, th I think that's what you're saying from your particular moment. And I think that's a right reading of this text. And you began by talking about what it means to be a, a peacemaker. When, when I was a kid, I, I quoted that, that, that verse when, when one of the bullies in my school was chasing me home and I, I got to, to the house and I ran up on the porch and I was just trying to get in the door and I, pointed my little nine-year-old finger in my in my enemy's face and I said, I will not fight you because the Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. And I am a child of God. <laughs> That's not what I did when I was nine years old. 
Well, it becomes, in the Bible. <laughs> it becomes a rememberable way because she actually remains friends with my cousin. And like 30 years later, they were talking about this incident. And she was like, yeah, Joy quoted scripture at me. What do you do when somebody quotes scripture at you and you just want to beat their face in? But it became an act. And peacemaking is not simply the absence of conflict. Peacemaking, and I think this is this is how I heard you, Matt. It is doing things that um, reduce the brokenness in people's lives. So it's not just the end of a conflict. It is the healing of disease. It is offering comfort to those who are brokenhearted. It is lifting up those who have been oppressed. That kind of action brings the fullness of peacemaking. And uh, I, I think that's the challenge of this text. And I, I really appreciate both of your uh, 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 bringing the before and where we're going as we look at this text and invite our, our listeners to do the same in, in their sermon. Set, set this verse up. Don't just use it as, okay, this verse stands, these verses stand by themselves and then we'll go somewhere else. No, this is this is a movement, a trajectory of what God has promised, is doing, and is yet to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which might in, invite us to um, turn to uh, look look at uh, your, your father's verse, but my favorite verse as well, um, and again a powerful, uh, familiar text uh, in the sixth chapter of Micah. Um, uh, where we're um, pleading our case and God is saying, you've already heard what you're supposed to do. And it's simple. It's action. It's to practice justice. It's to favor grace. And it's to live in a way that God is glorified. Now that's the joy translation of that verse, but I think it calls us to a little bit more action than simply being able to say, oh yeah, I've got this carved in a wood plank that's over my doorpost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think one of the traps with this Micah text is to, when it's, when it's placed next to the Beatitudes, I'd say the same thing about Psalm 15, because both Psalm 15 and Micah 6, 8 praise a kind of humble obedience and just, right. It's not, we're not looking for superstardom here. Just God, you know, is pleased by basic faithfulness. I, I, the trap I think is that that would make Matthew five, that would make the beatitude sound like basic humility. What Jesus is saying is be more humble, everybody, or be more meek or be more peacemakable um, be all of these things. And I think what he's saying is a little bit different in the Beatitudes. So I think that's one of the things the preacher looks out for that it's that I think Jesus is saying in the Beatitudes, I'm going to be amongst these people who are in at risk in a variety of ways. The beauty about Micah is it's not this comparison between religion and piety. I don't think Micah is saying, you know, don't don't give rams or don't give thousands of rivers of oil. I mean, all of these philosophers would call them, or an ethicist would call, would call it super arrogation, these amazing over and above levels of, of doing good or of gifts. It's not about the religious stuff versus the humble piety. I think it's about the difference between having a massive influence or impact and just day-to-day -day faithfulness, or what I would call more more proximate faithfulness, like where are you called? You're called to the people who are around you, who are the easiest to contact. You know, that's where you begin. That's where a church's mission begins. That's where an individual's act uh, of righteousness begins in those settings. It's where vocation begins as well, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I think that's helpful. And and what we get, of course, in, in Micah, is 
the, the, that connection. And I think the commentary does a really nice job. Do justice here, not a state, but an action. Love kindness without loving kindness. Justice is incomplete. Walk humbly or rather reverently with God. And I, I think sometimes, as you said, Joy, this verse, you know, gets on a plaque or whatever, and, and it, it makes for a nice uh, office ornament in many respects. And But I also wonder if people think that it's not something that they can do. That, that, and I think that's where I appreciate your comment, Matt, is that this, this is not asking for uh, something that's without, with, with, that's not within our reach. And, uh, and so that sense of, of this call of Micah 6, 8 in particular, how do we root that in vocation or how do we root that in daily life I think is helpful. I again, I'll go back to my um, my dad, but uh, and I think especially with him at the end of his life, I just watching him watching him do that on a daily basis uh, out of his little apartment in Richfield. Uh, where he really couldn't go anywhere or do anything at, toward the end, but he would write people cards and remind them of, of that they're being thought about, and and so it's it's I think it's a it's an important reminder to help people ground this in their daily lives, and uh, and and that that is uh, that's what's being called for really both in Matthew and in Micah that this is. We're not being asked to do something that's not within our reach. It really is within our reach, and and as the uh, and as we'll get to next week, the reminder that you are the salt of the earth is communal. It's all y'all, and so you know how it, how do we 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 do this? Uh, yes, on an individual basis, but part of a, a wider community that we're participating in justice because other people are participating in justice. We're able to walk reverently with God because others are doing the same. We are able to love kindness because because uh, we watch others do the same. And so that and that we can talk about that next week. But that that communal reality of this calling is really important as well. Matt, I actually appreciated uh, your uh, linking the reading of the Psalm uh, 15 in this. Um, uh, I, I, I had uh, highlighted this um, blameless walk uh, in doing what is right. And um, you, you, you were challenging us to not make humility of how, how we read the humility and um it, it it just made the fact that I looked at these these you know verses two and three um, in a way that is um, more challenging to us to say how do we act in a way that we are not guilty of causing um, hurt or harm uh, to others and and so blameless in that sense is not a piety says the uh, Wesley and Green with the Presbyterian. <laughs> but um, how, how is it, 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 it not that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of blameless, but it is not being guilty uh, to follow your lead, Caroline, of being a part of that community that is hurtful, that is part of that group, that in its eliteness, in its privilege, in its position, in its power, is able to cause harm to others. And, and, and so um, it, it's wrapping a verse, uh, a Psalm 15 in uh, with, uh, with Micah 6. Uh, I really appreciated that, Matt. Hmm. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think, yeah, Psalm, in Psalm 15, you're absolutely right that what's contrasted here is this blamelessness with people who slander neighbors. Mm -hmm people who hurt others, uh, people mm -hmm. who, who, you know, break oaths or lend money at interest, you know, who, who are predatory toward their neighbors. That's what humility is the opposite of. It's not necessarily, you know, retreat from the world or a kind of, you know, right. yeah. hold your head down, don't look up. Yeah. 
and it helps us also with Matthew, I think, in that we'll talk about this some more in the weeks ahead. One of the reasons Jesus gets so angry in Matthew and is so harsh is because people are getting hurt and they're getting hurt by religious folks, which is what I think makes Jesus so furious and impatient at times in that book. And so Psalm 15 is a nice reminder of that, right? That God desires humility because when people aren't humble, they see their neighbors as something, as, as objects or as people um, of whom they could take advantage and things like that. You know what I mean? It's not just about saying some personalities are better than others or whatever, whatever. And, you know, emulate Moses, who's the most humble man who ever lived. We know that because he says so in the Pentateuch. And, <laughs> you know, that kind of sappiness that sometimes pops up around humility. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 Yeah, but and it's sometimes the way of Christian leaders keeping other people in their place, right? Of demanding yeah. humility. And yeah. Sure. yeah. Anyway. Sure. And if, well, if I use if I use that back with uh, the the nine year old me, um, that you were being humble. I was not being humble. <laughs> you weren't being docile, I should say. There it is. There it is. It, it, yeah, better to use a different word to describe it. Absolutely. And and it becomes the question in terms of uh, so how is it that in all of our actions. Uh, if I if I dare to to move us to 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 uh, the epistle, how is it in all of our actions we ultimately point to Christ, point to the God made known in Jesus? Oh, uh, yes, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. and and it's and it's it's, it's mm -hmm. sorry. No, no, no. I mean, not a self boasting, a self right. It's it's yeah. what it uh, it's what is directing that our actions are. That our our behavior, our embodiment of these of this call of mercy and justice and righteousness and kindness, is at the end of the day a, 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 a lifting up, a, a pointing to uh, God, um, and beyond ourselves. Yeah, and pointing to uh, the Lord's the Lord the the blessedness of God. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, this is the terrible choice this week for preachers. I, I yeah. you've got this text from first Corinthians, which you could spend a month on. You've got the Beatitudes, you could spend a month on. You've got Micah chapter six, sorry, Psalm 15. You're not as exciting as the other three, but uh, so much to say here, but also this interesting contrast between foolishness and wisdom and of course, weakness and power and, mm -hmm. and God's decision, God's choice, God's strange choice to exercise power in the midst of weakness, which is just as upside down as, the, as I think what Jesus is talking about in the Beatitudes, the Beatitudes, again, aren't ethical. You all should be just nice, humble people. The Beatitudes are, I'm going to the places where people are suffering and where people are considered to have, you know, missed out in God's lottery. And I'm going to be present in those, those spots, just like Paul is stunned to imagine that a Christ could end up crucified. And just this is the basis of so much of Paul's theology, not just for understanding the cross, but for understanding the church and how the church also is marked with this cruciform identity and all that it all that it does. And so we're this peculiar source of, of weakness and of foolishness in a world that loves power and loves uh, certain sources of so-called wisdom. Right.